Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. So um, it's a pleasure today to have Daniela Roberts give our lunch seminar. Uh, Daniela is a grad student at The Ohio State University and her uh, research focuses on looking at um, small galaxies to understand um, hierarchical structure formation um, and how they lead to the formation of larger galaxies that we see today. And she will tell us today about looking for satellite galaxies around low mass hosts. Take it away, Daniela. Thank you. Um, so let me share my screen. Uh, make sure everybody can see it. Um, awesome. So thanks for the uh, introduction, Andrew. Um, but yeah, I this is also my very first seminar. So I'm pretty excited, kind of nervous at the same time. Um, so just bear with me in case I get a little lost. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm going to talk to you all about uh, finding low surface brightness uh, or finding low surface brightness satellite galaxies of low mass hosts. And I guess before I begin, um, I'd like to mention that if anyone does have a question, uh, don't hesitate to just interrupt me. Um, I think that's much easier than trying to find the chat window and see if anyone has any questions. So uh, just putting that out there now. All right. so. The outline of this talk is going to go as follows. First, I'm going to give a brief background on what satellite galaxies and host galaxies are and why they're important to us. Um, then I will talk about my first work in Cosmos, which, uh, which is where I look for satellites of low stellar mass host galaxies, but at high redshift. Then I will shift my attention to my current work in, with the DES survey. Uh, where I'm looking for satellites of nearby low mass hosts um, from for host galaxies in the Imagine survey. And then I'll let you all know what I'm going to do next. So uh, again, here's my brief uh, background. So in Lambda CDM cosmology, uh, we normally predict that host galaxies, which are the brightest and most massive uh, of a galaxy cluster, uh, these galaxies live inside of dark matter halos. Now, they're normally accompanied by less massive galaxies, known as satellite galaxies, and these satellite galaxies, in turn, also live in these uh, smaller dark matter halos called dark matter subhalos. Now, these satellite galaxies can be used to study uh, galaxy formation and evolution. We can study the distribution of dark matter, or we can uh, study the uh, influence of the environment on morphology and star formation. Now, we are interested in studying low mass host galaxies with stellar masses less than in log space, with stellar masses less than 10 and a half, and that have magnitudes uh, less than about negative uh, 18, and that's absolute magnitude in uh, V band. Here on the left, uh, I show nine different images of dwarf galaxies that span uh, six orders of magnitude and stellar mass. And I'm showing this to let you all visually see that we're searching for hosts that are similar to that of the LMC. And with the work that we're doing, we're able to get down to satellites that look sort of like Draco. Um, so one of the reasons we are interested in looking for these satellites of low mass hosts is because the extrapolated low mass end of the observed stellar mass halo mass ratio, which shows us how galaxies um, and dark matter halos are related, there is massive disagreements down here on dwarf scales. However, it is very successful at describing uh, large scale structures. So. Uh, things with sizes greater than uh, t like 10 megaparsecs in the universe. So in order to disentangle this low mass end or be able to constrain it better, uh, we take advantage of the three different predictions for these low mass galaxies. Um, the first one is uh, this using the stellar mass halo mass relation. So this also shows um, the same as a previous plot but just with the halo mass multiplied out on the y-axis. And here we also see how galaxies are mapped one-to-one uh, -to, -one to their corresponding dark matter halo. And in this relation, we see um, that for the low mass end, uh, there 
we predict that this should have a power law dependence, which I have um, written out here. Uh, okay. The second prediction uh, is that if we take advantage, uh, is to take advantage of this halo and subhalo mass function. So here's, I show this function and this basically shows um, the, the number density of dark matter halos per mass. And at the low mass end, oh, we also see that this subhalo mass function has a similar low mass slope as the halo mass function. And I've also written out on the screen for you all to see. And the third is the uh, satellite luminosity function. We're using a Schechter luminosity function, which um, also just tells us the number of satellites as a function of magnitude or mass. Uh, and this function also shows that at low luminosities, the slope uh, behaves as a power law. So together with the stellar mass halo mass relation, the halo and subhalo mass function and the satellite luminosity function, we can constrain uh, the slope of the stellar mass halo mass relation, uh, meaning that we can relate satellite galaxy abundances. So this to uh, the host galaxy's halo mass, which I mentioned previously. So over the years, uh, observations of satellite galaxies have been really important tests of the hierarchical structure formation and galaxy evolution. And since we live inside of the Milky Way, we have been able to greatly study satellite populations of the Milky Way and uh, Milky Way-like galaxies. And the number of observed galaxies orbiting our own uh, the discovery of these galaxies has really soared through the years. You can especially see within the last 20 years, it's like they the number of discovered satellites has grown exponentially, which is really great because that means we have bigger data set to work with uh, and learn more about these satellite galaxies. And we have seen that the study of these Milky Way satellites are really consistent with the empirical models uh, for how galaxies inhabit halos. But still, a big question is if our predictions are just overtuned to these types of galaxies. Um, therefore, it's re it really is necessary to study systems that are outside of the local volume. So just start studying a larger volume of galaxies. Um, also, we can start pushing the limit to lower mass hosts, which will allow us to help constrain the low uh, mass n of the stellar mass halo mass relation. And we can also look for things at higher redshifts, uh, which will help us understand uh, hierarchical structure formation uh, as a function of time. So uh, now that I've set all this up, uh, we can now dive into the first project that I did with Annika and collaborated with Anna Nirenberg uh, using this the Cosmos survey. So this was actually the first study of satellite systems of low mass hosts across half the age of the universe. And it allowed us to understand a uh, hierarchical structure formation uh, as a function of time. Uh, we were also able to uncover the bright end of the satellite luminosity function and also constrain the stellar mass halo mass relation, at least the low end of this uh, stellar mass halo mass relation. So first I wanna talk about uh, what the cosmos survey is so cosmos stands for the cosmic evolution or it's the cosmic evolution survey and it's the biggest survey done by the hubble space telescope it's a two square degree field in the constellation of sextants and it's a really wide imaged area that has really deep and deep, deep photometric and spectroscopic data and it actually allows allowed us to study satellites that were like fornax um that were five magnitudes fainter than LMC-like hosts, and of course, out to a redshift of uh, 0.8. Now, we used spectroscopic data uh, on our low mass host galaxies for this work, and we also used photometric data for the satellites. So, and we restricted the satellite's magnitude to be uh, greater than 18 in apparent magnitude, and this just helped reduce the contamination from the Milky Way stars. And the only requirement we had for um, our hosts is that they had to be in within the survey limit. 
So here on the left, I'm showing an image of a host galaxy from our data. And you can see that the host is at the center. And all the objects that are around it, they could either be satellites of this galaxy or they could be background galaxies. Um, and all of these objects around it, um, they were extremely faint for any efficient uh, or complete spectroscopic follow-up. So in order to determine if they're actually satellites of these hosts, we have to identify them statistically. Now, uh, the host stellar mass range that we looked at for this uh, study was between, again, in log space and stellar mass between nine and a half and 10 and a half. So this nine and a half um, lower limit, we chose just so that we could ensure uh, that we could detect satellites that were up to two magnitudes fainter uh, than the faintest host in our study. And this upper bound uh, was chosen in order to complement the work done by uh, Nirenberg et al. Um, so with our stellar mass range, we further divided this down into two different uh, mass bins. We have a low mass bin and a high mass bin. And then we further divided each of these uh, mass bins into a high redshift bin and a low redshift bin. And this was just done so that we could study the evolution of satellite luminosity functions for these different bins of stellar mass. Now, one way to statistically determine uh, the population of satellites um, is by looking at the average number density of objects normalized by the area of an annulus around the host. And in this case, we've scaled things by uh, R200. So this is an example from uh, Nirenberg et al. And this is for massive galaxies. So remember Nirenberg et al looked for, looked, did a similar study as what I did, but for a more massive galaxy range, which I showed here. And for these massive galaxies, we expect to have a very strong signal. And what we expect to see here is the number density of the sources increase as a power law near the center of the host. And then at large radii, uh, well, this increase in parallel will indicates that there is a satellite signal. And at large radii, uh, the number density becomes then dominated by the isotropic and homogeneous background objects. So this is what we expect to see for massive galaxies. So now let's look at what this same distribution looks like, but for our low mass galaxies, and let's see what we find. So here I'm showing the low mass bin uh, divided into the low redshift on the left and high redshift uh, bin on the right. And the first thing to observe is the amplitude of this y axis. Um, so for the number density of the number density of objects in the low redshift is actually greater than the number density on for the high redshift. And this is just due to the large angular size of the galaxy's Vera radius. Um, so at low redshift, this Vera radius will encompass a lot more objects, whereas at a higher redshift, uh, the projection of this Vera radius will be much smaller. Therefore, it, it'll only encompass a smaller amount of objects inside of it. Um, now, if we look at this high redshift bin, we see this clear over density, sig uh, over density signal of objects uh, toward the center of the host, which is what we were looking for. And this signifies that there is a presence of satellites. And beyond one uh, R200, we see that the signal starts leveling off, indicating that we have reached the background. Now, for this low redshift bin, uh, we don't really see the previously described trend that I mentioned. Um, and this just suggests that we probably don't have a large enough sample of hosts to detect a signal above the background. So when we make our luminosity satellite luminosity function, we'll only be able to determine an upper limit for this low mass, low redshift uh, bin. Uh, now, here I'm showing my high mass bin. Again, on the left, there's you see the low redshift bin, and on the right, the high redshift bin. And again, we observe the number density of objects is greater for this low redshift bin um, than for this high redshift bin, which is what we expect. So that was great. 
Uh, we also observed that the overdensity signal of objects near the center of the host halo for both data sets uh, increases. So this signifies the, pres the presence of satellites. And then beyond one R200, we see it sort of die down. So now with these radial distributions, we can now model this because this is a combined satellite and background signal. So we can now model this combined uh, po galaxy population signal to obtain a satellite luminosity function. And to do this, um, we infer each population's property uh, while taking also into account the properties of each host galaxy. And we inferred three different properties using a Bayesian statistical model. So first, we looked for the probability that an object is a background object or a satellite. Uh, we then looked for the probability of the luminosity functions for satellites and background objects. And we looked at the radial distribution for satellites and background objects. So assuming that each of these properties were separable, and using prior information about the background and foreground objects, uh, we were then able to isolate the satellite number density signal, which we used to create our satellite luminosity functions. And once we did that, we were able to plot a cumul cumulative satellite luminosity function shown here. So before I talk more about this, I just want to mention that I know there's a lot on this plot, um, but if you like to focus just on this work, which is uh, shown in these pink and blue bands for our high and low um, stellar mass bins, and um, these two bins, which are our low redshift bin and our high redshift bin. So these satellite luminosity functions uh, are the number of satellites per host within, the vir within their virial radius. Uh, as a function of delta M. And delta M is just the difference in magnitude between the satellite uh, and the host. So the first feature uh, I wanna talk about from, these, from this plot is the amplitude of this uh, satellite luminosity function. Um, and I wanna compare this, am this amplitude to that of the results from Nirenberg et al, which I show here in these green and gold um, colors, and you can see them here too, and that of Salas et al, um, which are these squares and triangles over here. So what we expect to see is that for each redshift panel, um, the lower mass uh, satellite luminosity function curves should group together. And this is an indication that the number of satellites for these hosts does not depend on the host stellar mass. And we get that because for low mass hosts below this uh, pivot point in the stellar mass to halo mass relation, so this is like the break in the power law, uh, for this area um, or for this region, the number of satellites becomes independent of host uh, stellar mass. And this is due to the self similarity of uh, the subhalo and halo mass function, and also the power law nature of this stellar mass halo mass relation. So this trend uh, that I just described is really observed in this center panel. Um, so the high redshift bin of this work. And for our two stellar mass bins uh, shown in these pink and blue curves, um, we see that there is this weak dependence between stellar mass and the number of satellites. So the curves uh, tend to bunch up. And we can see this best in this actually darker shaded region uh, where we had the best amount of data to constrain our satellite luminosity function. Uh, now comparing this to the work to the work of Nirenberg et al, which is shown in like these green and gold, um, we see that uh, for her um, satellite luminosity functions, the number of satellites actually increases with increasing stellar mass. So our curves lie below, below, at least below her highest stellar mass bin. And this, this is due because uh, the satellites that, or the host galaxies that they were looking at are actually above this, the pivot point that I mentioned. So seeing this separation um, is actually expected. And you can actually see it uh, better in the highest redshift bin, which 
which is where Nirenberg et al. really looked at, um, you can see this clear uh, starting to, these curves starting to separate. Uh, now in our low redshift bin, um, here we show our low mass 95% upper limit in light blue, which if you recall, this is where we had the least amount of data. So we can only get an upper limit for our satellite luminosity function. Uh, we also show our high mass sample band in this pink and the satellite luminosity function results of Salas et al in these uh, squares and triangles and they're color coded to be about the same color as ours because uh, their stellar masses were in the same range as ours. And also we show uh, the satellite luminosity functions of Nirenberg et al in these green and gold. Um, so you could see here that for the low mass upper limit, it's actually consistent with the, the same stellar mass range from Salas et al, these, uh, these squares. Uh, but for this high mass uh, range, it doesn't really bunch up as we were expecting it. However, it is consistent out to two sigma. If you also notice this uh, band also lies slightly higher um, above the luminosity function curves of Nirenberg et al. And there are two different reasons that this could be. One of them is because our data was actually really biased toward high stellar masses. So that's gonna increase the number of satellites per host that we see. And then the other reason we could be seeing this is because at low, at low redshift, um, so at redshift sort of below uh, 0.5, that pivot point in the stellar to halo mass relation is actually much lower than at higher redshifts. So seeing this discrepancy between uh, the stellar mass bins is sort of expected then. So the way we interpret then these results is that it is providing us a strong evidence that supports this power law dependence of galaxy mass on halo mass at low mass uh, galaxy scales. Now, the second feature of this luminosity function that I wanna talk about um, is the redshift evolution of this of my curves. So in general, uh, these cur the curves in our sample remain fairly constant uh, as a function of redshift, uh, given the measured uncertainties. And this result is actually pretty consistent with other uh, satellite luminosity function predictions, which say that uh, the, the satellite luminosity function should just remain constant out to a redshift of about one for a uh, fixed host stellar mass. And the third feature that we can extract out of these, this luminosity function is the faint end slope. So this property, uh, as I mentioned way at the beginning, this property can actually be used to constrain uh, the low end slope of the stellar mass to halo mass relation, which, can pla which places our results in the context of lambda CDM. So to do that, uh, we combine this low mass end of the sub halo and halo mass function, which as we mentioned is self-similar and follows a power law. And we also look at uh, the stellar mass to halo mass relation, specifically this low mass end, which I also mentioned also follows a power law. So by combining these two um, power laws and along with the slope of the satellite luminosity function, we're then able to constrain this slope of the, of the, this low end slope of the stellar mass to halo mass relation. Now, typical values of this slope range between one and two and a half. And we actually find, are able to find a lower limit with a value that should be greater than 1.3. So um, we're able to constrain it to to that. Um, so in conclusion, um, for at least for this uh, part of the talk for this paper, um, we were able to really uh, reliably measure the satellite luminosity function down to a difference in magnitude between the satellite and the host uh, of, two, of five and a half, at least for this uh, high mass low redshift bin. Uh, we we're able to measure it down to four for this high mass high redshift bin shown in pink and down to like three and a half for this low mass 
high rush have been uh, shown in blue. And these measurements are approximately equivalent to observing satellites uh, with fornax like magnitudes for LMC like luminosity hosts uh, out to redshifts of 0.8. We also see that there is this grouping of these, these satellite luminosity functions for our low mass host. And this is something you can especially see um, at this high, in this high rush of bin. And this indicates that the satellite uh, abundance is actually independent of host stellar mass um, for our low mass host. We're also able um, to determine in terms of uh, the, this luminosity function as a function of time, uh, we're able to see that we don't find any significant significant changes uh, to this satellite luminosity function um, as a function of redshift within the measured uncertainties. And this is in agreement with uh, previous studies. And finally, uh, using the slope of the satellite luminosity function, we are able to constrain uh, the low mass slope of the stellar mass halo mass relation uh, to be greater than 1.3. So uh, with COSMOS, uh, we have been able to probe the bright end of the satellite luminosity function uh, for low mass hosts at very high redshifts. But now we would also like to study uh, the faint end of this uh, satellite luminosity function and for hosts that are kind of closer by. So in order to do this, uh, we're gonna be using the DES and IMAGINE surveys. So we're gonna be looking for host galaxies in the IMAGINE survey and low surface brightness satellites in the DES year one survey. And one motivation we have to do this or to search for satellites in uh, this DES survey is because we may be able to confirm these as satellites with just the DES data by itself. So in the following slides, I'm going to show you all how I, I was able to statistically detect um, any potential satellite candidates first, and then with the addition, additional information that I have uh, from this DS data, I'm going to use that um, to further narrow down uh, the satellite candidates of these low mass hosts. Now, I'm first gonna give a brief introduction of what this IMAGINE survey is. So IMAGINE starts, or stands for uh, Imaging Galaxies, Intergalactic and Nearby uh, Environments. And it's a program that maps out the H1 environment in and around 28 uh, nearby spiral galaxies in the Southern Hemisphere. And it uses the Australian Telescope Compact Array and the Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia. And the goal of this survey uh, or this project is to determine how gas from the IGM fuel star forming galaxies. Now, out of the 28 imagined galaxies in the survey, 12 of them are in this uh, DES survey footprint, which I think actually looks sort of like a tank. Um, but 12 of these are in this footprint and the stellar mass ranges of these 12 galaxies are between uh, the LMC and the Milky Way in stellar mass. And the average distance of these hosts are is at about uh, eight megaparsecs. So I've added a few examples of these imagined galaxies uh, here, just because I think they really look cool. And if you notice, this was actually um, one of the, the galaxies that I used in one of my first slides. Um, now for the satellite galaxies, we're looking for we're looking for uh, the satellites of the, these 12 imagined uh, hosts in the year three uh, low surface brightness catalog from Tanoglidis et al. 2020. And from here on out, I'm gonna be calling this catalog um, the LSBG catalog. And the reason we're looking at this catalog or we chose it is because we can go down to really faint galaxies and which really allows us to further understand galaxy formation physics by doing an in-depth study of each, ga each satellite galaxy and its host. Um, and it also provides us with additional insight on the faint end of the satellite luminosity function. So we look for all of the LSBGs uh, from this LSBG catalog out to uh, four times the varial radius of each of these imagined hosts. 
And this was due to the difficulty of reaching a stable background signal caused by the proximity of these imagined hosts um, to us. Uh, so you can see something to like uh, keep in mind is that here you can see that some of these imagined host galaxies are in areas that are potentially pretty contaminated by objects that could belong to other sources. Uh, like here I have galaxy clusters or uh, other nearby galaxies. So uh, our signal for these few hosts could be extremely contaminated uh, by these other galaxies and objects. Now, in order to differentiate uh, between satellite candidates from the background galaxies, uh, we generated low surface brightness galaxy models using ArtPop. So ArtPop is this software uh, that Greco and Daniele, uh, uh, Johnny Greco and Shani Daniele, um, made um, and it's a software that pretty much synthesizes stellar populations and simulates realistic images of stellar systems so with the help of op art pop we were able to obtain lsbg properties similar to those of our real galaxies um, so for example here uh, we have our gal our a satellite candidate for galaxy ic5201 and if we believe this can't, this uh, real galaxy is at 10 megaparsecs, um, which is a distance to this host, we simulated three different galaxies, one at half the distance to the host and the other at twice the distance to the to this host. Um, and uh, these after simulating these three galaxies, uh, we looked for the best fit parameters uh, that would show us if this can that if this candidate were to be a satellite of IC5201, uh, its galaxy properties would be consistent with those of similar similar stellar mass in the local group. So for each imagined galaxy, we modeled a what a satellite galaxy could look like in order to like machine learn our brain so we could more accurately differentiate between potential satellite candidates and uh, background um, background galaxies. So once we machine learned our brain uh, with that, we were able to then visually inspect uh, all the LSBGs and remove any a galaxy with obvious morphological features that would uh, be consistent with background galaxies. And these features are like uh, compact galaxy centers, uh, large spiral arms, um, or just clear star forming regions. And because of that, this is why we uh, discarded this galaxy here on the left. So you can see it has like some spiral arm features. On the other hand, this galaxy on the right is pretty smooth and puffy. And this is what we would expect to see for our candidates, since we believe them to be early type galaxies, which are just galaxies that have fallen into their hosts and becoming quenched. So therefore they display very smooth and featureless uh, morphologies. And you can see that uh, pretty well in, with this image. So once we visually inspected um, all of these LSBGs, uh, we then had a satellite candidate data set that could be used to statistically find satellite galaxies, um, a satellite galaxy signal for each host in different uh, mass bins. So just like with Cosmos, uh, we expected to see an increase uh, over density signal toward the center of the host. And this, this would mean that we would be observing satellites and then as we go further away from the host, we expect the signal to sort of plateau. Um, and this would indicate that uh, we have reached the background. However, for our two smallest stellar mass bins, we either did not find a signal in the, cent in the central bin, and which is sort of expected because for these the lower stellar masses, uh, none of the LSBGs pass the visual inspection in that region. We also weren't able to observe a very strong uh, over density signal toward the center of our host for this slightly more massive uh, stellar mass bin. And there are two th reasons why this could happen. One, because uh, our sample is just not large enough uh, in these lowest mass bins in order to achieve a, detect a detectable signal. And two, 
because as I mentioned earlier, the location of these imagined hosts um, is just very unfortunate. So there's just a lot of contamination um, right next to them. Um, yeah. So on the other hand, um, for these two highest mass bins, uh, we see that they exhibit a strong satellite signal, um, something that we were anticipating. And then uh, along with the signal plateauing at a larger radii starting at around uh, one R200. Therefore, uh, we, can, we can happily say that we expect to see a non-negligible number of satellite galaxies uh, associated with this larger stellar mass bin um, uh, galaxy sample. Now, we were also able uh, to see the presence of a satellite signal when we bin the LSBGs by color. So here on the left, we have red, and here on the right, we have blue. And this just further indicates that there does exist a potential satellite galaxy signal around our imagined uh, host galaxies. So these two distinct uh, radial distributions that I have just showed uh, allows us to statistically confirm that there is a presence of satellite galaxies uh, in the imagined or for our imagined host. And so now since we have observational data on each of these LSBGs, we're now going to use that in order to further cut down on the background to in order to obtain a cleaner sample of the potential satellite candidates for each of our imagined hosts. And we do this by first plotting the satellites, the satellites on this size, uh, luminosity, stellar mass uh, space from uh, Shani Danielli. So the backbones of this plot uh, is by Shani Danielli, um, but all the satellites that you see on there are from my work. So we use this uh, size luminosity function um, where the black line indicates the best fit line for all known dwarf galaxies uh, in the local group. And this green shaded region shows the two sigma uncertainty of that. And this relation uh, allows us to identify uh, the best satellite candidates of each host due to its completeness down to a low stellar mass. And it's good to see that our candidates actually have structural properties similar to those in the of local, similar to those in the local group, um, if they were at the distance of their hosts. And also, we were sort of expecting this because when we made our art pop models, we saw that uh, our our simulated LSBGs also followed properties of galaxies um, in the local group. Uh, next, what we did is we used a log normal distribution uh, to assign a weight to each of these satellite candidates based on how far it, it was from this uh, best fit line. Um, and these weights were chosen in order to find uh, the lowest weight, weight acceptable that could result in a high confidence uh, satellite candidate. So first we started off by only selecting satellite candidates that have a weight uh, greater than 0.8. Um, and we find that six out of these 12 imagined hosts uh, follow this uh, satellite candidate condition that we, that we made. Um, we then created a, a mask for each individual satellite candidate. There were about 20 in total. And we ran PIMFIT, which is just a, a Python wrapper for MFIT on each of these satellite candidates. So by subtracting out this uh, smooth light profile of each uh, satellite candidate, um, we were able to then further determine if this, uh, if this satellite candidate could indeed, be a, could indeed be a satellite or a background galaxy. And we know this, or we can find this out by looking at the residual image. So if we see a clean subtraction of this um, LSBG model, we could classify it as a potential satellite candidate since uh, we know that least massive dwarf galaxies, uh, so galaxies less than that have a stellar mass less than around 10 to the eight, almost never display uh, spiral features. 
So in total, there were about 16 LSBGs uh, that followed this condition. And this is just an example of one of the satellite candidates of IC5201. Then there were three um, satellite candidates where after we subtracted out uh, this model, um, the smooth light profile, we observed in the residual image some spiral arm features um, and like bright centers. So this just suggests that these are could actually just be background galaxies and not actual satellites. So this was a satellite candidate of, uh, for example, NGC 7090. So now that we have now have a cleaner satellite candidate list for our host galaxies, uh, we would really like to compare this to the theoretical predictions of the satellite luminosity functions. And so far, we're only able to obtain for these an upper limit um, because we're still in the process of folding in the surface brightness and effective radius cuts from the LSBG survey. Uh, so this upper limit, though, tells us that we should expect to see a handful of satellites per system. So between like one and 10 for our lowest delta M's and even zero as we get to higher uh, delta M's. And when we compare these predictions to our to our observations, we actually see that they match quite nicely since we're only seeing a couple of satellite candidates for only a few hosts which is sort of what we expect. Um, also, uh, because these LSBGs are nearby, we can actually also hunt for their globular clusters to see if they have any. And the reason we would want to do that is because they could help determine the distance to these LSBGs, and that will help us confirm if they are indeed satellites or not of these imagined hosts. So using the luminosity function for the number of globular clusters that we expect uh, for a galaxy of a given magnitude, and this is uh, this is from Prol et al. At least the backbone is from Prol et al. And on top, I have plotted my um, satellite candidates. We can expect to see at least uh, one globular cluster per uh, LSBG. So this then gives us a green light uh, to go ahead and see if we can find any globular cluster uh, for our LSBGs. So then using source extractor, uh, we then searched for globular clusters and then further narrowed down those, that candidate list uh, by using a combination of the globular cluster luminosity function and where they normally lie in color color space. So out of the 16 satellite candidates that we have, only nine of them uh, have potential uh, globular clusters. And we know this isn't a huge number, but that's okay because at these distances and uh, inferred absolute magnitudes, we know that not all of them will have uh, globular clusters just because uh, it becomes super stochastic for which galaxy has a globular cluster or not. So, um, that's where I am with uh, my current work of DES and um, Imagine Hosts. So now, so right, nine out of the 19 satellite galaxies have uh, globular, potential globular cluster candidates. So now I'll share with uh, you all some of the future plans that I have um, for my work in order to wrap things up. So the first thing, uh, I want to do is lower my satellite candidate weight threshold. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, right now I cut this weight at 0.8, but we're thinking of going down to like 0.6. Um, and this is just in order to find the lowest weight acceptable uh, that would result in a high confidence um, satellite candidate list. And remember the weight is just the distance uh, from this best fit line and my uh, LSBGs. So I would, I'll also, um, so right, so by lowering this rate, this weight, uh, I hope to create a high probability satellite candidate list. And with that, I hope to confirm any of these satellites through uh, ground-based imaging since they are pretty close by. 
Uh, I also hope to connect some of these satellite galaxies uh, to H1 using the Imagine radio data. And this will just help us determine how gas from the IGM uh, possibly fuels star forming galaxies. Uh, I also want to continue hunting for globular cluster candidates, um, just because it'll help us find distances to our sat to our satellite candidates and confirm them or not as satellites. Um, but we could also know more about the globular cluster luminosity function um, and see if it does remain universal uh, for small galaxies. And finally, I just want to graduate. Um, I'll hopefully wrap this up in the next uh, couple months and then maybe a month or two after that. Uh, I just hope to defend my thesis and, and graduate. So uh, thanks a lot for listening. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, I will try to answer them to the best of my abilities. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, Daniel. Um, yep, that was really nice, really interesting work. And we have plenty of time for questions, if people have any. Just raise your hand in Zoom and I'll call on you. Well, people are thinking, I have one quick question. So in your kind of conclusion slide there, you said that you, you wanna follow up on some of these candidates with ground-based imaging. Um, for a poor theorists like me, can you, do you have an estimate of like how long, uh, how deep imaging and how long would it take to get the data you need to, to make those confirmations? Right. Um, so that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure how long um, or how, like how, how long imaging we would need, uh, but I know uh, there are several proposals um, coming up I really forget for what, um, but I really hope to have like a candidate list uh, before then. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not too sure. I think that trying to confirm these satellites will come after possibly I graduate. So I'm not, um, I guess, too familiar with that. So sure. Yeah. yeah. Let's see, uh, Shannon, you have a question? Yeah, uh, enjoyed your talk, Daniela. Um, I was wondering, do you think it would be beneficial to use the photometric redshifts in Cosmos to help beat down the noise on your uh, satellite radial profiles? Um, so you mean all the way back in Cosmos? Yeah. Uh, so, so using the photometric data for the satellites? Yeah, uh, I think... There's, uh -huh. there's some pretty deep catalogs now in Cosmos where you can get, um, you know, good photometric redshifts um, for galaxies of stellar masses down to 10 to the 9 um, mm -hmm. at redshifts of like 0 0.3, 0 0.4 uh, mm -hmm. to, to, you know, 1% in, in 1 plus Z. Uh, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you can use, if, you know, you think it might be beneficial to use that as just additional information to weed out some of these foreground, background galaxies. And, you know, um, just, I mean, you can see the error bars and some of those points yeah. maybe improve on those. Yeah, um, I think that would be very uh, helpful. Um, I think that when I did this uh, study, um, we used, uh, I forgot what exactly, I think it was from the, LIGL catalog, um, but we used like some photometric uh, uh, data that we had for these, and I think that's all we had. Um, maybe in the past couple of years they, that's improved, um, but I bet, yeah, if we did use any improved um, measurements, it could definitely be down the, the background, which is something we so desperately need, right, especially for like, um, for, I can't go back. Okay, yeah, for like these, um, for my lowest mass bins, because at least for this lowest mass bin, because we just could not uh, get a signal above the background, no matter how hard you tried. Gotcha, thank you. Yeah. All right, Anna, you have a question? Yeah, I have, a, I have my own question, but actually the follow up here. So um, can you remind me, so these mass ranges, these are for the host galaxies, right? Yes. 
and then the satellites were two magnitudes or like two orders of magnitude yeah like we lower uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right so so yeah then maybe i guess i think shannon mentioned that it like goes to 10 to the 9 but you are going to like 7.5 right in yeah uh, that limits okay is it two magnitudes or two orders of magnitude uh two ma two magnitudes okay. um so then it doesn't go down to to the level of seven and a half i guess um yeah um, you can get down to 10 to the, i mean uh so what is that like point it's like less than an order of magnitude two magnitude so um and, and mass so you know at least for the lower redshifts you can get you can get pretty good photos these in cosmos um mm -hmm. and masses of 10 to the 9. Mm -hmm. yeah um yeah i think like i said i think uh back when i did it maybe that was the catalog that i just used um but I bet right now, if we were to redo it, maybe we could we could uh, beat down the that background even more. Okay. Uh, thank, yeah, thanks for clarification. Then I guess I I yeah misunderstood. Uh, but then my yeah my my question was about the uh, low mass and slope you or or the limit you put there. So could you give us a little more context like that? Um, uh that range that you said is typical for the the slope like uh where is the range oh. coming from mm -hmm. like is it for in different like is it in different environments or or yeah and kind of right um so okay so we in order to get the slope um what we did is uh we used the slope of this uh, of our luminosity function, and I guess there there was a lot of error because, as I mentioned over here, like we only have an upper limit and stuff. But I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. But uh, I know like if we were able to relate the the slope of this uh, bright end of the satellite luminosity function, um, and then like work backwards with everything that I mentioned to constrain uh, just this low mass and slope, I assume up, up until our mass of like 10 and a half. So here, I guess down to where our mass um, range limit was. Um, so this was only for the the, the host galaxies that, um, that we could see in Cosmos. Uh, yeah, and I think this is really interesting. Yeah, I, I, I like this idea a lot and this is my nice work and I understand it's challenging. Yeah. So I guess I, I yeah, I wanted to get a sense of what does this mean sort of for, for these more cosmological models that like is this range like uh, or in different cosmologies is like this beta parameter different. And so like your limit, does it exclude some models or are there some, some more caveats? kind of observational oh, that they're right. trying to play here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not I'm not exactly uh, sure. I think that may be um, maybe a little too deep into um, what I've done. Um, but, but yeah, I, I'm not I'm sorry. I would have to think about that a little more. Sure, you can follow up on that. Thanks. Yeah, of course. But I just I think like at least with these luminosity functions, I think it's really cool that like we can relate um, just by looking at the satellite luminosity functions, we could relate the abundance, like how many satellites we have. We can relate it all the way back to uh, this host halo mass and this slope, um, which is something I think that it is is really cool. We can like ju really juice this. Yeah, and it's I, yeah. such. So far away from us, it is mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any more questions? All right. I don't see any. So in that case, uh, let's thank Danielle again for a really nice talk, and thanks everyone else for joining us. Thanks very much. Really thank you. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Aniela, and good luck.
spread sharing. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for coming. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.